Matthew chapter 26. Now, I know that today is Palm Sunday, and, uh, and then Friday is going to be Good Friday. We have uh, Bishop Huggins and, and uh, Michael McCurtis coming, and then we have Easter Sunday next week, a week from today. Palm Sunday is where Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, and they're laying down the palm leaves, uh, palm branches, and their cloaks, and they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We've covered that in our study in the book of Matthew. And though this is the, the triumphal entry, and we can go through the statistics looking at, gosh, um, Nehemiah chapter 9 and, and Daniel and a bunch of other prophetic comments where Jesus, when he came in, it was the exact day and hour that, that the Father had predicted. But I, I, we've covered that. And so um, I'm not going to do anything specific to Palm Sunday, uh, but I will stay with the text from where we left off last week. And then uniquely with the Lord, uh, the text itself also uh, ties in with Palm Sunday. Uh, but I will say this um, before we read the word. Interesting week, and it'll tie in the story, so bear with me, and you'll be standing in a minute to read the word. Uh, I, I, was, I, I went back to St. Louis, Missouri, uh, left Wednesday night, actually uh, 12.30 Thursday morning, so I left midnight, 12.30, around there. Uh, took a red eye to St. Louis going through Minneapolis because you can't get to St. Louis direct uh, on the airline I was flying. Minneapolis, and so, you know, segmented sleep. Um, I was, uh, just didn't get a lot of sleep. Land uh, in the morning, get to the hotel. It's about 9 o'clock, and I'm supposed to speak at 10. Uh, really not enough time to even take a nap, and I'm, I'm, dr I'm dragging a little bit. I, I do the invocation for the event. It's an American Renewal Project. Um, Eric Metaxas was there. Uh, we had um, the Attorney General of Missouri was there. A number of speakers came out. And, um, and then I had my Issachar training that I do with the pastors in the community who are interested in running for office like I did, training them. And it was just really well received, and I was very, very tired. Uh, we still had an evening event. I told the organizers, I'm going to go and grab some sleep. And they said, fine. And as I went back, I set my alarm to wake up to still get there for a portion of it, and I slept through the alarm. What woke me up was a phone call from one of my kids, um, and, uh, and it, was, it was disheartening news. Uh, I won't go into it. it. It's not as, it was something that we were counting on that didn't happen. Let's just leave it at that. Something we're counting on that didn't happen. And it was, it was somewhat devastating. Uh, it, it made us all sad and adversely affected us. Um, and, you know, I'm being positive through this process. And watching is the turmoil in the country. And you're watching as our president, uh, um, adultery he has committed and, and things that have happened. And it's all on the news and omnibus bill and speaking to pastors about it. It just, it was tiring, tiring. And uh, I have to get back. Uh, I've got to catch a flight the next day. I, I'm very groggy. And I have a, a memorial service that we did yesterday. And we also had a men's breakfast in the morning. So I get to the airport. And when I get to the airport, um, I, I'm on time and everything. And they say there's weather delays on the eastern seaboard. Uh, the flight from St. Louis to Minnesota is delayed to Minneapolis is delayed. Okay. So I wait. I get on the plane. Finally, I'm boarded, and they park us on the tarmac for 25 minutes. It, irritating. I would have rather been inside where you can enjoy yourself. So sitting in the cattle car waiting for, you know, somebody to give us clearance to take off, and they do, and we land. And if you've ever been to Minneapolis Airport, it, the way they laid it out, somebody, uh, I, think it was, I think it was designed the Monday following the beer festival uh, weekend. <laughs> And, and I'm running from the gate I'm at to get to the other gate because the connection, I'm going to miss my connection because of the delay. I'm running. I literally get there. And do I look like I run? Uh, I get there, and I am, I am exhausted. I, I'm, I'm shaking. I get there, and they say, Mr. McCoy, I said, yes, uh, we've just closed the gate. And I, I said, the plane's right there. And I see the door. Just grab it. Just, I'll, I'll walk on. I don't, I don't even have any, I just, I literally, literally, this is my, I'll just come on. Let's do it. I'm sorry, with that really patronizing smile that you just don't enjoy. And, um, and I, I, I was polite, and I said, okay. I said, what, what do you propose I do? And he says, well, you can get on standby in the other flights. And I'm thinking, oh, standby. Um, and the only flight that's open is tomorrow morning. Oh, really? Okay. And Oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you, while I was on the plane waiting to get off, they didn't have a gate agent come to connect so we could get off the plane. We're just waiting for, and the guy keeps ringing, bing, 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 ringing the bell so someone will come so we get off the plane. So I was late 
their fault, not mine. Just saying. And they weren't listening, so I call, and I'm on the phone for an hour trying to figure this out. I get on standby in the next flight. 41 people deep on standby, and they're oversold by seven seats. <laughs> Snowball's chance in hell of getting on that flight, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so I'm standing by the gate just thinking, well, all right. Well, I fly a lot, so I've moved up. And now I'm number one to get on the flight of 41 people. And there's seven oversold. And now I'm, I'm looking. This is going to happen. And I'm excited. The gate's going to close in three minutes. We're going to give your seats away. I'm watching. Three minutes. Okay. I walk up. I'm, I'm here. Three minutes. Let's do this. And um, she's waiting. And the other lady's typing. And I'm, hello. And they finally say, well, the one lady says, let's hold. There's two first class passengers. And there's a number of others. Let's just hold. They're, they have a cart coming. She runs out to wait for it. The other lady's like, this is not right. I'm... And so finally, she, she gives me a boarding pass. Now, boarding pass is gold. She says, here, Mr. McCoy. I'm like, thank you. It's first class. I'm like, coming through. <laughs> and the other lady who has rank says, um, I'm going to need that boarding pass back. I said, ah, ah, I'm a Christian. OK. <laughs> and she takes the boarding pass, and she says, I'm sorry. And the people that come literally, you know, they're young and vibrant. I'm old and heavy. And they're, and they're walking like this to the gate. And the attitude. And I'm watching them come in and I'm thinking to myself, I ran. They didn't. They get their seats. This is frustrating. And they give the seats and it's looking as though not going to happen. And the sweet gal over to my right, just as they're getting ready to close the gate, she goes, Mr. McCoy, there's one seat left. Here you go. And I get on the flight. I'm like, thank you, God. Now, I had a first-class seat. They gave me a coach, which, uh, a, a Economy Plus, which I thought was first-class. I sit down. I'm like, gosh, why are there three people in first-class? This is odd. The Lord put me next to this person that, as I'm getting ready for the memorial service, I'm reading, and they, they, they said, what are you reading? I said, well, I'm reading Scripture, preparing for memorial service. Oh, what do you do? I'm a minister. I could tell by their reaction they weren't thrilled about that profession. <laughs> the entire flight from Minneapolis to LAX was an opportunity to have them not be so irritated by that profession. And when we landed, there was a complete transformation, an opportunity to share the Lord in such a sweet way where we were laughing the whole way and, and it was a divine appointment by the Lord. Now, I could have easily been irritated, frustrated, walking up and down. What's the point? You're going to see that there is a phrase in the passage of Scripture we're about to read that if you want your life to count and you want to understand how the Lord works, you need to hear this passage. This one phrase will transform your Christian walk. Please stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. We're going to pick up at verse 26. Verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now we pick up where we're going to study. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, here we go, pay attention. After I've been raised, here we go, pay attention. After I've been raised, here we go, pay attention. I will go before you. I will go before you. Uh, let's say that together. I will go before you. In this case, I will go before you too, Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. So Peter rallied them. But the Lord said, I will go before you to Galilee. I will be betrayed. I will be crucified, but I will go before you to Galilee. Let's pray. Lord, would you instill in our heart the strength of that statement, I will go before you. Lord, will you use your word that's alive, living and breathing, to just place in our heart a confidence in the God who holds the heavens in the span of his hand. Would you comfort all those who feel as though 
circumstances and trials have overwhelmed them and they don't see a way out. But Lord, you declare, I will go before you. And so with your word, Lord, I pray you'd bring comfort and I pray that you'd bring peace and I pray you'd bring strength according to your riches in Christ. So we commit ourselves now to you and we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, have a seat. So in this passage of scripture, they have the Passover meal. Jesus talks about the cup of the new covenant. Uh, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you for the remission of your sins. Uh, a total transformation of the Passover that the sinless lamb of God in a moment would be slain. Uh, within hours, Christ will be betrayed. He'll be uh, tried and crucified, buried, and then resurrected. And this covenant, this, this commitment that the, all of your sins, past, present, and future, will be covered by the blood of, of the Lamb of God. He lays this out, and they can't fathom that, and he's been speaking to them, as we've studied the book of Matthew, he's been speaking to them about this crucifixion, that he, he's going to be crucified, but every time he adds a crucifixion, he always adds a resurrection. And then he says to them, um, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And what he's saying is... I'm, I'm going to be taken down tonight. Tonight's the night. He'd actually told him there's 48 hours to go. He actually gave him a time clock. And he keeps repeating this. And he's saying, and you're going to stumble because your leader is going to be struck. Your leader is going to be struck. And it reminds me of Isaiah 6 where uh, the, the passage reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory. Now, when, Isaiah, uh, when, when King Uzziah died... I, uh, the only way I can describe that to you is take the most profound political leader or those that you would have the greatest hope in and have them taken out and then everything that's the antithesis of what you believe is ushered in. And that's, that's the picture when King Uzziah died. All of the hope of Israel was in a very godly king who's now gone and everyone is distraught and overwhelmed as though, you know, Israel's going to hell in a handbag. We can say that. America's going to hell in a handbag. There's just no hope. I mean, we can't believe all the things that's happening, and we can just go on and on and on and overwhelm ourselves. And we think it's insurmountable. There's no uh, opportunity to overcome this. And if we want to take it off the national scene and just bring it local, and let's just bring it into your family or bring it into your life, maybe you've, you've got some addiction issues, you've got some relational issues, you've got, we can go through the whole gamut of things that you are burdened with and overwhelmed by, and whether it's financial or health, or we can go on and on and on. And, and, and then the picture is Isaiah, when everyone else was distraught, it was Isaiah who said in Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. He took his eyes off the problem and put his eyes on the Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, there's no weapon fashioned against us that will stand. See, what happens is the bigger your God is, the smaller your problems become. And, and this is the picture that God says to them, you, your, your shepherd is going to be struck. The sheep are going to scatter. You're going to struggle. This isn't going to make any earthly sense to you that your leader is gone. And in his death, there's going to be strength. I mean, it, you're, you're going to scatter just like the light turns on and the cockroaches run. And I'm telling you that this is going to happen tonight. But then he adds this, but after I have been raised... He doesn't talk about the crucifixion without the resurrection, but after I have been raised. And any Jew understands the significance. You hold up the pole that Moses held up, and this is where they get the, the, uh, the, the logo for all physicians with the snake wrapped around the pole. This healing, everything is raised up. He's going to be a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. God is there. He's going to go before you. Everything in the Old Testament speaks of this. I'm going to vanquish your enemies. He says, after I have been raised, this idea of raising up this, this banner of God, after I have been raised... He says, I will go before you to Galilee. That's where we spent all of our teaching time. That's where we hung out together. I'm going to go before you. I'm going to meet you there. We already have a pre-appointed location, I told you, on the mountain. And if you read other gospel accounts, they knew exactly where to go. He says, I'm going to go before you after I have been raised. After I have been raised. After I have been raised. He's been repeating this. And he's looking at these amazing saints you know, Peter and St. John, and, and you think they get it. Three years after I have been raised, ta-ta, after I have been raised, ta-ta. And you think, oh, oh, he's going to be raised. No, the first thing out of their mouth was, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I'll never be made to stumble. <laughs> Peter, 
That's irrelevant. After I have been raised. After I have been raised. After. Peter, you're not getting this. None of you are. Assuredly, Peter, I say to you, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Forget about you. After I have been raised. After I have been raised. Are you getting it? Because they didn't. I think Jesus should have taught like that. But that's me. And then Peter still doesn't get it. Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. And the Lord's saying, what are you, you don't understand. I don't need you to fight for me. I got this. After I have been raised. <laughs> Death can't hold me, fellas. You're going to stumble. Understand you're going to fail. In your weakness, my strength will be made manifest. I, I will gain strength when they bury me. I'll rise from the grave. This is going to be a testimony for the world that the grave won't hold me. Do you understand this? And they didn't. I love what Isaiah 65, 24 says. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they're still speaking, I will hear they didn't even know what the Lord was saying, and they weren't even prepared to pray, but the Lord already had the answer before they ever were able to come to that place to accept it. This idea of I will go before, I, I wanted to show you the theme throughout Scripture. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 1, the Lord your God who goes before you. He will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. I'm, I'm going to go before you. You know, it's, it's, it's like a running back and you got this just behemoth of a human being that is doing the blocking. And, and you get a blocker like that and as a running back, you're like, this is great as he's plowing through. And that's, that's, a, that's, that's a lineman. You have the God of the universe going before you. Nothing can stand in his way. Nothing can stop him. It's a confidence in the agency of who he is. You think, well, this is overwhelming. The problems are too big. I will go before you. I'm running blocking. There's a pathway. You understand that's crooked and there's mountains in the way and there's just all kinds of struggles. Not only will I go before you, my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. I'll cut them all off. I don't care who's in your way. If God before you, no one and nothing can be against you. My angels will go before you. I will go before you. One angel wiped out 178,000 Assyrians. Can you imagine what two-thirds of the heavenly forces can do? And they're going before you. Each one of you is assigned, apparently, according to the Gospels, you know, a, a guardian angel. Mine is exhausted. <laughs> and, and these are all enemies, the Amorites, the Hittites. I can go through a historical account of it, and, and you would realize that God is, is moving forward on behalf of his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, in the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. I want, you, I, I want everyone to read that quietly and meditate on that. I don't care what you're dealing with. Read that. <coughs> do not fear. Do not be dismayed. He goes before you. I don't know what trial you're facing or what troubles you have. That is your God. He goes before you. Isaiah says it this way. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I, I, I look at that as addiction. You're trapped. You're imprisoned. God's going to break every chain. I, I'm, I'm in a crooked environment and I'm going to make it straight. It's my, my thinking is warped. My life is warped. I'm going to straighten it out. I've got this. I will go before you. And then it brings us to the passage that we read. But after I have been raised, I will go before you. Where? To Galilee. Now, one of the things that we struggle with in relation to God going before us is we don't feel as though we're worthy to have him work on our account. 
And that's a, that's a struggle for me. I, I, I think, yeah, I know God can do it, but why would he want to? <laughs> I've gotten myself into this mess all by myself. And I see no reason why he would be even remotely interested in helping me. That's a lie of the enemy. God loves you. He's for you. He's not against you. You're, you're not saved because you've earned it. You're saved because he established it. There's, there's none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God isn't impressed with you because you're more moral than me. He fights on our behalf. He goes before us regardless of where we are in the, in, in the process of what we call sanctification. We're all justified, just as if I'd never sinned, but sanctified, being set apart for his glory where we're operating in his stride and we're realizing he is going before us and we're following that, that hole that he's blowing open as we're going through on level ground that's straight. But the realization is each of us are in a different area in regards to this idea of sanctification. And some of you don't feel worthy of it. Well, you know what? God's a, God doesn't just go before you because you're faithful. He goes before you even when you're not faithful. Just read the story of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. He was supposed to go to Nineveh. Did he do that? Has anyone read Jonah? He was supposed to go to Nineveh. Did he go to Nineveh? Ultimately, he did, but no. Initially, he went the exact opposite direction. God said, go here. He went there. I can't fathom that kind of disobedience. I mean, that's like, right? 180 degrees. God says, go here. I go there. That's the things that I, I, I should do and maybe I even want to do, I don't. I go this way. I go to Tarshish. I, I go as far away from what God wants as humanly possible. Because this requires faith. This requires that he goes before me. And he's going before me, but I can't see him. He goes before me and he, he does things that I can't quite fathom. And I don't know how he operates. And it, it, it would be much easier to follow a lineman than it is the Lord because I can see a lineman. And this requires faith. And what is faith? Well, what is the foolishness of God? Divine wisdom demanding faith. Faith is hoping in things you can't see. He goes before you. I'm, I'm not interested. I know. And the, the interesting thing about sin, which is the opposite of what God wants. You know the interesting thing about sin? I'm familiar with it. I know what I'm going to get every time. I know what I'm in store for. Uh, I know that it's going to pick me up and then, of course, drop me way down below where it promised to pick me up. None of you have ever had this problem. I can see by the sneering eyes you're giving me. <laughs> and and I, I, I know what I'm going to get. This is a constant. I know what I'm going to get. And it's going to leave me shipwrecked, but it's mine. And it's visible. This is intangible. Other than his word, where is he? That is tangible. I know where Tarshish is. And you're wanting me to go to Nineveh. I hate those, th those people. And I don't want them saved. And you're calling me into a relationship with people I don't want to have one with. I'd rather go to my hometown, and I know this is the opposite of what you want, but this is, this is what I'm comfortable with. God's in the business of stretching us. And listen... When you're outside the will of God and you're going the opposite direction, he still goes before you. Did you know that? I mean, finally he sets the storm and it is, it is a raging storm. And Jonah realizes, I want to tell everybody on board the ship, I'm responsible for this hell you're going through. Sin doesn't just affect me, it affects the people I'm with and the people that I love or I'm connected with. And I want you to know, everybody on this boat, you are being subject to this hell because of me. So you do yourself a favor, just throw me overboard and let's call it a day and the, calm, the storms will calm. I am outside the will of God. He hates me. He wants nothing to do with me. And they throw him overboard and what happens? Oh, big whale shark swallows him. You go, there's no such thing as a fish that big. Look up whale shark. Look up people being swallowed by it. Look up people living having been swallowed by it. End of story. <laughs> and, and in the belly of this beast, he cries out to God. And God's in the business of bringing us to the end of ourself. 
and reducing us to a minimum that he might pour in his maximum. He just wants us to trust him that we will follow him because he's going to lead. That's what he's teaching us to do. Follow the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. He'll break all the chains. This is the way you go. Oh, but I know better. God says, no. And when you get out of line, fish, oh, that's how it works. <laughs> He takes all of creation to bring you back to where he wanted you to be. He takes all of creation to bring you back to where he wanted you to be. He takes all of creation to put you on that straight and narrow path because he loves you. And he still goes before you when you're outside his will. And the fish swallows him. And in the midst of that, he just cries out to God. What's precious is the fish spits him up on the shores of Nineveh. Partially digested. <laughs> let me tell you something. He looks like Fire Marshal Bill. Ah, let me tell you something. And while he's on the shores of Nineveh, you know, and he still is having his pity party, he still is used of the Lord to bring him back to that place where he watches Nineveh repent and sack lots of ashes. Fascinating, profound. My point is this. You may be outside the will of God. He still goes before you. You're his child. We don't give up on our kids when they're in, in rebellion. We pray for them. We let them experience the consequences of their actions. We, we let God put them in alignment. Yeah? And the Lord is so good at that. He's so good at that. And we fail at times. But the, so, the, the, the profound nature of this passage that touches me is that Jesus says, after I have been raised, I will go, bo go before you to Galilee. And you know, actually, we find in, in the later passages of Matthew, which we'll get to, this is Matthew 28, verse 7. And the angel says, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And indeed... He is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. The angel of the Lord tells this to the women. They're like, okay, okay. He went before you. He's waiting for you in Galilee at the appointed place. You can read this on your own. We don't have a lot of time to do it now. And he lays this out. I said that I'm going to be raised from the dead. I told you I'm going to go before you into Galilee. The angel is telling you, go to Galilee. That's where the Lord is. He's on his way there now. He's on the road to Emmaus. He's just walking with the other two guys right now, talking about the scriptures, sharing with them on that straight and narrow road, breaking all the chains. He's in control. He always has been and he always will be. One of the things that touches me about the Lord going before us is this picture of the parting of the Red Sea. And you know, for the Israelites, they had a light in front of them. You know what the Egyptians had? Just complete darkness. And, and the Shekinah glory, the presence of the Lord, is a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. But, but at night, they got, the they got the fire to see where they were going, and, and the, the Egyptians got a, a, a cloud of smoke where they didn't know where they were. And, and the Bible says that the Lord, his word, is a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. He orders the steps of a righteous man or woman. He goes before us by his word, one step at a time. Just follow the light. Follow where he's going. Just like a moth. Just follow the truth. Just That's what he's saying. I'm going before you. I'm lighting your way. It is a lamp. What you're holding in your hand is not just a book. It is a lamp. It is a path. It is a direction. God is going before you. Who is the word? Jesus is the word. And I love this. Because with Peter, he says, Lord, they're all going to bail on you. I'm not. I am the guy. I'm standing with you. And the other disciples, they kind of were in agreement. Yeah, Peter's going to do it. We're doing it. Oh, let's do it. We're going to take him down. And, and the Lord is going to directly redirect Peter like he did Jonah. Uh, Peter, the only thing I need for you to do is follow me. I will go before you. I will go before you. I, I don't need your sword to take off the ear of Malchus when they come to take me. Matter of fact, I'm going to put that ear back on so you realize you're going to live by that sword. You're going to die by it. He heals the high servant's ear right there in the Garden of Gethsemane. We'll cover that. He says, Peter, all I want you to do is follow me. I will go before you and you will follow me. I'll go before you and you'll follow me. Is, is everyone getting this? I'll go before you, and you'll follow me, Jesus says. If the Lord says, go this way, he's going before you. Don't go to Tarshish. If you go to Tarshish, he's really good about getting in front of you and orchestrating fish and partial digestion. <laughs> this is much nicer. There's consequences to this. You're going you're gonna to live many more years without uh, hair, and you'll have some scar tissue from the stomach acids. Right? 
It'll, you'll be odd. Well, let me tell you, son, how this happened. <laughs> I will go before you. He did this for Peter. He said, the angel said to them, go to Galilee. The Lord said he'd go before you. And John 18, Peter is really on his Tarshish quest. He's going away from Nineveh. He, he is, he's still stuck in this, I'm not going to betray the Lord. And, and actually, as you remember, Jesus said to Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Three times. So we find him in John 18, warming himself by a fire. He's, and, and, and I've done this many times, but it's so fitting. Now the servants and the officers who had made a, everyone say fire of coals stood there for it was cold and they warmed themselves and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Everyone say fire of coals. coals. It's important and you'll see in a moment. So Peter's warming himself. Do you remember our story about Judas and the woman with the very costly oil of spikenard and how the fragrance, the olfactory senses create memory recollection? Remember that? And how it infuriated him? That fragrance filling the room. Christ is covered in this fragrance. Judas is so irritated by it, he went out and hanged himself. Remember the story? Working with me here. God is in the business of directing us, and he takes all of creation to realign us. A whale, he'll even take a fire of coals. You see, in John 18 and in John 21, it's the only time in the entirety of the scripture where this one word is used. John 18, 18, and John 21, 9. It's the only place in all of Scripture that this one word is used. It's called anthrakia. Anthrakia. It's from the word anthracite. It means black coal fire. That's why they translate fire of coals. It is a smell that's very pungent, almost like burning tires, but it is a very efficient fuel that can be carried in a knapsack. It's like charcoal briquettes, but it comes from anthracite, and they carry it, and they will cook their food over it. And it's expensive to purchase in that day and age. And in this case, they're making, and it's a, it's a warm fire, so they're drawn to it and expensive. So he's in the courtyard. These Romans have this anthracite. He's warming himself by a black coal fire. And then that's where the location, as the fumes of this black coal fire are filling his nostrils, he's warming himself. The fumes are filling his nostrils. He's warming himself. The fumes are filling his nostrils. And the little girl says, you're one of them. He says, I swear to God, I don't know him. Another person declares, he says, I don't know him. He's actually cussing when the third person comes and he vehemently denies that he's a disciple of Christ. The third time he does this, the rooster crows. <laughs> and he went out and wept bitterly because he was on his way to Tarshish and he realized the Lord will go before you. Go to Galilee. He realizes that he had had it all wrong. God doesn't want, he, don't fight for me, just let me go before you. Trust in me. In John 21, 9, that same word is used. As soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals. That's the other anthrakia. And there, uh, and fish were laid on it and bread. So these are the two places where this word anthrakia is used, black coal fire. This is anthracite. This is what they would use for that. There's the picture of Peter warming himself by this anthrakia, and uh, they're, they're accusing him, and uh, I thought it was kind of a cheesy picture, but it's the best I could get. And then the third time he denies it, the rooster does crow. <laughs> and as we remember in the passage, Jesus said to them, assuredly I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times takes us to John 21, 9, where Jesus is resurrected. He's met them in Galilee, where he said, I will go before you. I will go before you. Yes? He gets to Galilee. On the shores of Galilee, they're out fishing. They've caught nothing. It's God's using all of creation to remind them that he is God. And at that moment, he says, cast it on this side. They do. They have so many fish. And somebody yells out, it's the Lord. Peter realizes it's Jesus on the shore because he says, have you caught anything? He says, well, then try that side of it. And they throw it over and there's fish. And, and when all this happens, Peter puts his clothes on, which is strange, jumps in the water and swims. I was a swimmer. 
the, the idea, if you want to be really sleek and fast in the water, is you, you don't want to wear a lot of clothes. And yes, I wore a Speedo. And we would shave our, the hair off of our arms and our legs to go faster. Peter did not understand this concept. He put his outer garment on and then jumped in the water. And you know the big sleeves that just catch a lot of water when you're trying to swim? <laughs> Doofusville. He's just swimming, you know, and they're rowing next to him going, he's just, he's, it's Peter. He's not right. <laughs> There's a reason why the Lord called him the rock. <laughs> when they get to shore, who's the one who's freezing cold? And there on the shore, Jesus has made a fire of anthracia, black coal fire. And as he makes this fire, Peter's warming himself, and it's by this fire on the shores of Galilee, where the Lord went before him, as he had promised. And he says, after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And there it is. And on that shore, with that man who had a lesson to learn, God said to him, so when you've eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, Jonah, love that. Do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. Everyone say one. one. Everyone say one. one. Let's go to two. And he said to him a second time, everyone say two. two. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And everyone say three. three. He said a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my sheep. He didn't say, you loser, you pathetic human being, you have failed to honor me. He just told him to feed my sheep. I want you to get back on track and do what I've called you to do. And of course, we know that Peter denied him three times. We know that Jesus asked him how many times? If he loved him. And what are they standing by? Anthrakia. And the fumes are hitting him. And the first time he asks him, it takes him back to the, Lord, you don't want anything to do with me. There's nobody on this planet who's failed you more than me. I told a 13-year-old girl that I didn't know who you were. I cussed at her. I had a chance to stand for you, and I'd given you my word, and I still let you down. You even told me I was going to deny you, and my pig-headed ego assumed that I could do something for God. And my fear, and my trepidation, and my bondage, and what I, everyone I, I thought would think, I was just so, I was just bound. My, my, my thinking was warped. That Fragrance is just driving me insane. What, what is that smell? I can't get the picture out of my head. It's like PTSD. Just flashbacks. Nobody's let you down like me. Why are you asking me if I love you? You, you know I love you, but there's nothing in me that has it, 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 any capability of doing what's right. When I try, I, I fail. The things I don't want to do, those are the exact things I do. And the things that I want to do, and I swear I'll do, I don't do them. And now the smell, what is this smell? It's just failure. Why are you asking me to feed your sheep? I'm the biggest loser on the planet. Do you love me, Peter? Yes! I love you, but I have no ability to obey you. Yes, you do. You can do all things through me. But on your own, I told you, you can do nothing. Abide in me and I will abide in you. Do you understand how this works, Peter? You've been crucified, just like I have. It's no longer you who live, it's I who live in you. You are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah glory of God, a pillar of fire by, by night and a cloud by day. I reside in you. Lean on me. Trust not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge me. I will make your path straight. I'll be a light unto your feet, a lamp unto your path. Trust me. Now, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Then feed my sheep according to my commands, with my ability and with my strength. Follow me. I'll go before you. 
Third time. And, and, and on this third time, all Peter can hear is the rooster crowing and the condemnation. And yet God is saying to him, I'm not done with you. I wasn't done with Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. And I'm not done with you. I'm in the business of making a saint. And I love how the passage ends. Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, Peter, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. And when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. You used to do things on your own accord. Now it's time to let me lead. All I need you to do is two things. Follow me. The God of the universe goes before you. It's really simple. Follow him. That's just not rocket science. That's Christianity. Your enemies will vanquish. You'll be going through an airport in Minneapolis and you're thinking, oh my goodness. And yet the God of the universe is orchestrating you to sit next to this person to present that gospel to that person at that time and you're still going to make your events tomorrow. Relax and be nice. Oh, and you got bad news about one of your kids. <laughs> Do you think I'm asleep at the wheel, Rob? I got this. For lack of a vision, the people perish. Set it for the family. You're not a thermometer, Rob. You're a thermostat. For lack of a vision, the people perish. Set it. Am I, am, are you going to follow me? Do you know that, that I seek good for your life? Will I work all things together for good with those who love me and are called according to... Yes, Lord. Then does this... Does this persuade you to not follow me? Do you doubt me because it didn't fit in your alignment? No, Lord, I trust you. Then just follow me. Feed my sheep. Tell them the story about how you struggled in the airport. Tell them the story how you struggled when the bad news came. And let them know that you're following me. It's going to be all right. And the apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's all we're called to do. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. He'll make your paths straight. I love that. He went before them in Galilee, told them where he was going. And he said, Peter, you used to do things by your own desires. And when you get older, which means more mature in the faith, there's going to be stuff that happens to you that the world will say, why was he crucified upside down? Why did you allow good things to happen, bad things to happen to good people? And the Lord says, you don't understand. I know what I'm doing. Do you trust me? Meaning, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Then all you need to do is follow me. You don't have to figure me out. Just follow me. And trust me, you'll enter into lands that you didn't build and you didn't work, and, and they're yours. And there's an abundant life awaiting you with obedience. I, I, I have to tell you, this ministered to me this week, and I pray it does for you. You may have plans, and the plans of a man's heart are many, but it's the Lord who orders the steps. And you don't like the steps that he's giving you? Well, guess what? Follow him. Trust me. It will work out unbelievably well. And you'll look back and go, how did you pull that off? Seriously, how did you pull that off? I've never had a conversation like that with anyone on a plane before. How did you orchestrate that? Before you prayed, Rob, before you prayed, I already had the answer. I'd already lined up all the delays across the eastern seaboard to make that moment happen. <laughs> now, would you just follow me, please? Calm down and follow him. I will go before you. I will go before you. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I hate to end on that dance, but we're going to do it. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. 
we rejoice in your faithfulness, Lord. And here we, we come to the beginning of Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry and Good Friday will be your crucifixion, which the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will scatter and it just doesn't make any humanly sense, but then to realize that your kingdom would come in power and the first person you needed to instill that in was Peter. And you even said to him that after I have been raised, I will go before you. I will go before you. And Lord, you did just that. And you used all of creation, anthracia, black hole fire, olfactory senses, fish on the left side of the boat, or was it the right side? I don't remember. Whatever you did, it didn't make any human sense. And you just instilled it into Peter's heart and mind. Didn't I tell you I'd go before you? The only thing I want from you, Peter, is to follow me. Trust me. You know I love you. I'm going to do good for you. Follow me. And so, Lord, here we are today. We know that you as we look at Good Friday, we'll be crucified. But then you declare, I will go before you into Galilee. And Lord, we await that resurrection Sunday, a renewed strength in our faith that we wouldn't be tossed about by every wind of doctrine, but we would realize, God, you may not make any earthly sense, but when you say, follow me, we will obey. And so Lord, we thank you for that. We pray for an increase in faith that we would honor you and walk in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, let's stand and we'll close with a song of worship.